Hi, everyone. We're back again with uh, Dr. Andrew Corbett for the second part of our, our chat about F.W. Borum. Andrew lives in Tasmania um, with, his, with his family and he pastors a church there. We've asked him for this interview because he's an expert on F.W. Borum, on all things Borum. If you missed part one, we'll make sure that the link for that is in the description to the video so that you can catch up. But we're going to get straight back into it. Uh, we left off, Andrew, with um, Borum arriving in Mosgill. And what we're really giving people is a, a whistle-stop tour through Borum's life, just a bit of an overview. If you want to know more about Borum, please check out the documentary series that Andrew's been a, a significant part of and helped produce. And even uh, I remember seeing you, you interviewing some of the folks in uh, Mosgill who still have memories and contact. And, um, and, and so, yeah, Borum arrives in Mosgill. And you, you mentioned that there was a, a great work that, that happened there. Perhaps you'd, you'd like to carry on and, and keep the story going. Yeah. So Mosgill obviously was a, a Scottish enclave and uh, uh, obviously just being outside of Dunedin, you know, another Scottish enclave that he describes the, the, the deacons that greeted him at the train station as men with um, faces like granite, but, he said he, he came to appreciate, you know, you imagine these big Scottish beards that they had at the time. And, but he describes them as having hearts of gold. And uh, I, I think I mentioned that it was, this, this really became the moment when F.W. Borum, the last disciple of Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, went from being just, went from being a preacher to being a pastor and preacher. And it was the, the Scottish ladies essentially who, who beat him up good and proper about how he was cold and couldn't hold a conversation and didn't really know how to keep a conversation going. And, and then one of them made, made this a comment to him that you, you, you're just not hearing our stories. And that was what the lights went on. And that was the turning point for Borum who became a, a pastor in the sense of really wanting to hear and understand people's stories. And, when he realized that everyone has a story, it changed the way he viewed pastoring. And he actually, for the really for the rest of his life, he, he had this ability to enter in to people's lives. So what he did in Mosgiel was, was amazing. They went from a small, fairly rudimentary building to uh, build a, a larger facility. Then after he left, he, he spent nearly 12 years there. And then after he left, or, sorry, nearly 10 years after he left, um, that was uh, rebuilt again. And it's, it's only just recently, Jeff, you may be aware it's um, it's going to be demolished because it doesn't meet New Zealand earthquake standards. So, uh, but having said that in the documentary, I, I, I interviewed um, one the, the last, essentially the last pastor at the church there. And he tells the story of a lady who came into the Mosquil Baptist church and he he got her details and then visited her on the Monday just to follow up her, her visit yeah. and and just asked how did you how did you come to be here and she said and I've only she said I've only just recently become a Christian after reading a book that I found in a secondhand bookstore and he said oh what was the book well it was a book by a man by the name of F W Boren the luggage of life and he said well you you may be surprised to know that the church you visited on Sunday after you made your decision to follow Christ was the very church that he was the first pastor at. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I heard that as a, uh, he, he shared that with me. Uh, and I thought, isn't that amazing? And he was thinking it was amazing too, that some 50 or so years after uh, Borum had passed away, his legacy was still living on through mm -hmm. his, his books. So that's, so I think that's an amazing thing. From there, uh, he, he and his wife, and, and that's an amazing story how they met. I don't think we, we went into that, but it's an amazing story of their courtship and their marriage and, and their, um, their time in New Zealand. Uh, she came to him toward the end of his time at Mosgill and said, I think the Lord is going to call you to Hobart, Tasmania. And... He said, don't be ridiculous. <clears throat> Hobart has the Hobart Baptist church was one of the largest Baptist churches in Australia at the time. It had a very established presence in the city and it was a quite a prestigious appointment. And he, 
he said that that would be r ridiculous. Well, as it turns out, they they did invite him to come, and strangely, in 1906, they invited him to come on a I think a six month probation, mm -hmm. and so they packed up everything in New Zealand, bid farewell to people, and even that had some amazing events happen around his farewell. That uh, they came to Hobart on a six month probation. <laughs> And uh, it was very obvious after about the first three months when the, the congregation size of Hobart Baptist Church had doubled mm -hmm. and people, the, the, the diaconate realised, what are we talking about probation? Forget that. You've got the job. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that church ended up having uh, not, only, not only filled, but people were queuing up mm. to get in on a Sunday morning and Amazingly, we're talking 1906 to 1916 when Borum also had an evening service, a 7 p.m. service, and he he announced uh, one Sunday night that he was going to talk on uh, the following Sunday, texts that changed history. Um, and that ended up becoming five books uh, mm. eventually. And uh, but he also realized as soon as he said it, he thought he only had one to go. He only had one. And that was mm -hmm. Martin Luther's text. And, and so he, he realized he needed to uh, alternate his his sermons. But anyway, they had a 7 p.m. Believe this, a 7 p.m. Sunday night service from uh, 1906 to 1916, where he was there. This is this is um, gaslit you know candles and so on at night this is arriving at church on horse and carriage this is this is amazing it's just it's amazing to me because here where i am you know my church i've got all the mod cons and people go oh sunday night oh i don't know <laughs> but they, they were prepared to do it and eventually what happened was people started to come from around australia because borum's reputation as a preacher had grown so significantly and then people be, began to make the trip from the UK to mm. come and hear him because his books were now selling in London mm. and he, he was, he was becoming a, a, a well-received author in that space of uh, Christian literature really. And so one day Archibald G Brown turned up who was the, one of the successors to uh, Charles Spurgeon in, in London. So this was incredible honor because this was the man that Borum went to study as a, just to, to hear Archibald G. Brown was considered one of the three greatest preachers in the world in his day. And so what an honor that he came to hear Borum because he had heard that Borum was now becoming one of the most influential preachers in the world, which is, which is an amazing thing. Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to step back to New Zealand for a moment, mm. um, Borum's influence kind of stepped, stepped a little bit beyond beyond the church in New Zealand. Mm. Um, could you recount really quickly the story of how he became acquainted with the Otago Daily Times and ended up contributing yeah. quite regularly to, to the newspaper? Yeah, so so Borum uh, came to New Zealand at the age of 24. He had already published articles in uh, Clapham, the Clapham Observer, and then began to be published um, uh, in other uh, London newspapers. F.B. Meyer had written uh, a commendation of his his first book that was uh, a small book but it was published there as well so he had developed a, a a love for what he called scribbling and so he was preaching uh somewhere in dunedin at at, a, at an event and he missed his the train um and it was quite a a, a while for the next train to get back to mosgill and he noticed if you if you've ever been to the Dunedin train station, you look up the road from there, you'll see the Otago Daily Times. And and he saw it there, and he saw the lights were on. And he thought, ah, mm. oh, why not? I might as well go and offer my services. And so he went there. Now now the Otago Daily Times, I think, is still the largest privately owned newspaper in the world. It's oh, wow. it's a quite a an, um, an amazing feat. So. So the owner ha happened to be there that night and and spoke with um, this pretentious young pastor who turned up and offered to write for the Otago Daily Times, quite a prestigious newspaper. And the the editor um, owner said, well, I actually 
I, I'd be interested to see what you what you would come up with. Gave him a piece of paper, gave him a pen, and said, "Yeah, just show me what you can do." And he he wrote about the Boer War and how there was a need to you know defend the mother country and all the rest of it. And uh, he he was citing um, Edward Gibbon, the the famous historian, because yeah, the rise he, and fall of the Roman Empire. The yeah, big, that's right. Yeah, big. and and he said, you know, if we if we don't defend the the you know the outskirts of the empire, we'll be like Rome. That basically that 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 premise. And he he thought, well, I don't know what he'll do with it. As it turns out, it made the front page, it, <laughs> it, and that began a weekly editorial article by Borum for I think the next thirty eight years or so. Amazing. And he also, um, and, and other newspapers would pick him up as well through time. But yeah, so that's an amazing story. I think also it's w worth noting around that time uh, when Boren was 31 years of age, he was appointed the superintendent of the Baptist churches of New Zealand. Mm. And that took him to obviously North and South Islands. Yeah. And so he was, he was gaining in his reputation as not just a, a preacher, clearly as a writer but also as someone who who deeply cared about the church and uh it's it's easy sometimes for people to become cynical and borum never did he never became cynical of the church and at one point jumping way ahead in the story he 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 met people who said oh, i'm not i don't want to be on committees i don't want to be on boards or things like that uh, i'll just leave that to others and he said you know if good people don't step up, then we will end up <clears throat> with those that we get who may not care as much as we do about the church. Mm, sure. And uh, it's one of those things that probably, well, there might be people who need to consider that, uh, that, that God might want them to be involved in yeah. something beyond their own four walls, which is something Borum embraced very early on. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's exciting. So still in Mosgill today in the library in Mosgill, they've got mm. a Borum collection, haven't they? There's right. a little bookcase tucked, yeah, tucked yeah. around behind a corner. So if people are local and wanted to go and have a look at that, there's there's a whole bookshelf full of his books and his books are available to buy pretty. Yeah, a lot of them have, are being reprinted now by John Broadbank's publishing and, and they're available. And um, so some of them are, are being reformatted in the sense of um, uh, fresh books are being done. Um, uh, Jeff Pound, uh, my colleague, has uh, he 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 really um, does a lot of effort in preserving the memory of F. W. Borum, mm. and uh, he he actually took one of Borum's manuscripts that was unfinished and found it and and finished it off. And it was really uh, a 365 day uh, devotion yeah. of, of, of his newspaper articles that had never really been assigned to a date and, and, and put in a, a thing. And that's what Boren was working on uh, when he died and he never finished yeah. it. So yes, there's, there's um, previously unpublished essays and things like that, that appear often on the, the Facebook page uh, so if you, if you search F.W. Borum on Facebook, you'll see that as well. It's quite an active community now. Sure. So we've left him in, in Hobart. And, and where where from there? So, well, Hobart was interesting. When he arrived there, just for your information, it it really was a quite an established church. And, and of the, I think, the first 11 Baptist churches that were started in Tasmania, nine of them were started by uh, what's called, what we might refer to as Spurgeon's men. And so oftentimes these, these churches um, have the, the Met tab uh, printing columns at the front of them. And so you can see, and they're all, all across Tasmania. Um, but when Borum arrived there, the church had had a split um, over the, the particularly difficult theological topic of the sound acoustics in the building. <laughs> and, <laughs> he arrived there and, uh, was told now which side are you on and he said essentially i'm not on anyone's side i just i've just come to preach the word and to minister on behalf of christ and he really stuck to that and and he made pastoral visitation because of what he'd learned in new zealand he he would go out every afternoon uh walking 
uh, around Hobart to visit. Mm. And he would try and make three or so calls an afternoon, uh, at least five uh, afternoons a week. And this and is on one leg. On one leg, which no one knew about because he yeah. used a walking stick and he, he, he was able to hide it. Uh, I'm guessing at, at, at times that there's still horse and cart around. But interestingly, and this, this one sort of messes with my head a bit because a few months in, church had doubled, things were going well, the, the deacons were absolutely thrilled with what was happening. And then Borum gets them together and says, gentlemen, we have a crisis. And they're going, crisis? You've got to be kidding. All the people that left because of the split, they've come back. We've got more people coming. This is wonderful. You've done a great job. And, and he said, no, no, we've got a crisis. We are not reaching the unsaved like we should mm. <laughs> so, so he said i propose that after our 7 p.m sunday service we we hire the hobart town hall and put on a series of winter meetings through winter on with an evangelistic um, emphasis and he printed pamphlets inviting people um uh, just very very evangelistic topics and it was uh, just the, at the town hall. And, and they, they ran from something like um, uh, 8, uh, 15, 8, 30 at night through to about 9, 15 at night. Yeah. And you just think, this is amazing. Uh, he, so he would do his Sunday night service, get in a horse and cart, go down the hill in Hobart to the Hobart town hall and um, have this outreach meeting through that winter. The church grew by another 150 people as a result yeah. of that campaign. I, and I, I just, you know, I, 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 when I was studying this, I thought, this guy's amazing. He is zigging while everyone else is zagging. And I, I think incredible things. So, uh, but 1915, of course, the war broke out. We, yeah. You know, you and I, well, you're from the UK, so you may not appreciate the, the depth of feel that happens in Australia and New Zealand on April 25. With Anzac Day, yeah, and Borum had I mentioned written that first article for the Otago Daily Times about the need to get behind the Boer War and to send um, New Zealand men over to mm. South Africa to fight in that war, and so he was very the, the word might be jingoistic in the sense that you know very naive about God, King, and country, and then he did the same thing in 19, 1915, rallying mm. the young men of Hobart, particularly the young men of the, the Baptist church there, uh, to go and defend the mother country. Sure. When April 25 happened, and literally, I think on the first day, it was 8,000 men died and from, from Australia and New Zealand, and then the casualties just mounted up, it, it, it really affected Boreham. And yeah. it affected Boreham particularly because in those days, the government who would issue telegrams to the parents of the, of the lads who had been yeah. killed in battle would actually give those telegrams to the pastors mm. uh, to go and to deliver. And so Boreham says he was delivering telegrams every afternoon for six days a week for 365 days in a row. And he said by the end of it, he was emotionally broken and the the uh the diaconate at at hobart realized that he was he was a spent man because he he felt responsible yeah he felt responsible for the deaths of, of these hundreds if you ever go to hobart baptist church they have a fellowship hall adjacent to the uh the sanctuary it's a very it's a very mm, grave scene to see the plaques along the wall with the list of all the names of the men who died in that war. And so uh, Borum's health deteriorated physically. He was, he was not in a great place. And he was, it was so bad that his, his doctor said, you actually need to recuperate somewhere where you don't have the stress of all the administrative responsibilities plus the pastoral responsibilities. Sure. So, um, he accepted a position uh, that came out of the blue for him to go to Melbourne, a place called Armadale, another relatively new church. It had only been built recently. And, and again, it was a, a 500-seat um, sanctuary. It, it had a staff of several people. 
It had a, a membership of, of around about 500 already. And so Borum came there and they looked after him really well. And uh, that's essentially where Borum settled for the, for the rest of his days mm. in that he pastored that church until 1928. From that, he re-preached um, many of those sermons that he preached uh, at Hobart and, yep. re and, and wrote them as the books in that, that series of books called texts that changed, changed history. Yeah. And so there's, there's five books in that, in that series. And uh, Jeff, I, I think the way he wrote was very intentionally classic. Yeah. What I mean by that is after the events of 1916 and the war, he made a vow that he would never preach or talk about war ever again. And when World War II happened, after he finished up at Armidale in 1928 and wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, except when he left Pastors College in London, he said, it is my intention to pastor three churches and then to be available to the body of Christ mm -hmm. and to be able to minister across denominational boundaries. That is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And so he went from Mosgill, Hobart, Armadale, there were, there were his three churches, and invitations came to him over the next few years to preach in various churches. And he ended up, his longest stint would take place from uh, 1938, just before the war broke out, uh, in a Presbyterian church, uh, uh, um, Scots Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, which is right in the centre of Melbourne. Yeah. And he was there for 18 years preaching at a lunchtime service that initially started out as one 45 minute service for office workers in the city yeah. that then became two of those services. So they would do one, have a break and then started another one for other office workers. There was about yeah. 1200 people that were coming to that lunchtime service. Amazing. Um, and then, and again, same thing, people were traveling from around the world because now Boren was not just, famous in England. He was now famous in America. He's famous in Europe, South Africa. Yep. He had multiple uh, invitations to come and pastor churches in South Africa and yeah. and across Australia as well. But he, he felt that, that this was what he was called to do. And, and many of those messages became books as well. In fact, uh, just just before the war broke out, he he thought that his days were, were over. He was in his early uh, late uh, early 60s and he he wrote his memoirs here my pilgrimage yeah and it's uh it, it's i would say for people often ask well, which book should i read first i would say if you're a pastor read my pilgrimage yeah because it will do your soul good and mm -hmm. it will do your 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 love for the pastoral ministry good as well because here's the story of a man who god called as a pastor but wasn't a pastor yet he became a pastor and he talks about the delights of being a pastor yeah he he has an allusion in the opening couple of sentences to the war that was happening because of uh german uh activity in 1938 it was becoming obvious that the world was heading into war you may be aware that, that Germany used to be known as Prussia. And he talks about an event that happened uh, when the Prussians were defeated in 18, March 3rd, 1871. Yeah. And he says that was a very auspicious day. Not because that happened, because that's the day I was born. Yeah, yeah. And But it's a, an amazing thing where he's able with a wave of the hand to say, we've been here before. We've History is re somewhat repeating itself. I'm sure we'll get through this. And he never preached on the war. He never mentioned the war, mm. never did a sermon on the war, never wrote an article on the war. He wanted to take people's attention off the everyday and the mundane and put it onto infinities, um, e eternities and immensities, he, he called it. That, that became yeah. his thing where he just wanted to lift people's vision beyond. And I think, Jeff, that's why you can read many of his essays now and go, that is incredibly relevant now. This is this is like he's speaking today because he wrote very intentionally from a, a, a classic point of view rather than the, the, the now and here sort of yeah. uh, perspective. 
my, my pilgrimage is I, I'd, I'd say that was probably a really good place to start as well because mm. it's funny and he endears himself to mm. his reader and the language is I could understand if it wouldn't be for everyone. It's it's perhaps a little bit flowery, but at the same time, if you can, if you push beyond that, there's such a, a depth and a and a richness there. And you know, you know, you're talking about calls to different churches, calls to South Africa, fame in America. He's well known in the UK. Um, I remember you telling me, and I was shocked when you when you said it that his publisher, the Epworth Press, had said he was their biggest catch since mm. John Wesley. Mm. Um, and that yeah. just seems that just seems absolutely incredible yeah. that he could be right. so so how does this guy be how can you be so famous a uh, hundred years ago mm. and, and not even that 70 years ago yeah. and yet modern evangelicalism seems to have forgotten him a little bit you know there's a there's a resurgence here, yeah but but how did how did he get yeah. so forgotten? yeah there is and well a couple, couple of things firstly um he didn't have a twitter account that's probably his biggest <laughs> problem and then Secondly, that's where i'm going wrong <laughs> <laughs> and and seriously he, he actually didn't push himself he didn't promote himself he he and, and i think this is the thing that uh frustrated me about learning about fw Vaughan. it it just messed me up his genuine humility yeah because i think let, let me give you an example the, we, you know, Jeff, you and I, we, we figured out how to be falsely humble. You know, we, 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 we brag <laughs> and make it sound like we're actually being humble, but, but boy, <laughs> didn't, didn't do that. Right. Oh no, I'm not very good at that, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Everyone says I'm so good at that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, let me give an example. 1924. It was about when he recuperated. So in other words, he'd been eight years in the pulpit at, at Armadale and, <clears throat> and his health was restored after eight years, which is an amazing effort, I think, on the part of a church to care for th their pastor as well. So 1924, he's invited to go to London to be the speaker at the London City Mission Annual Conference. He had started his street preaching with the London City Mission. Yeah. So this was, uh, you know, they thought this was a bit of a coup to have the, the great author, the great, you know, preacher come, uh, who started out as a as a 17-year-old boy on the streets with them and, and now look at him. And so the conference normally attracted three or 400 people. They had a, a hall to hold 400. When it was announced that F.W. Boren was coming to be the speaker, they began to get so many inquiries, they, they thought, oh, we may need a big hall. So I think they, they, they went a little bit larger and then the inquiries kept coming and, and they, they thought, this could, be, this could be big. And so they hired the Queen's Great Hall, a three and a half thousand seat uh, mm -hmm. venue, one of the largest indoor venues in London at the time. For some reason, I don't understand. Well, now, of course, we don't understand. So they, they didn't ticket it. It, it was just come and so on the day Borum arrived 10,000 people were waiting to get in now they had to put on an impromptu second meeting they crammed as many in as they could uh, I think they put 4,000 or so or 4,500 into the, the, the first session and another 4,500 into the second session where he repeated it again and, but they still had a thousand overflow. And so they did a, they took a thousand people, put them in St. John's Anglican church across the road and had men at the door relaying uh, into St. John's what Boren was saying. So, uh, you know, now he came back to Australia and he never mentioned it. Yeah. He never wrote about it, never told a soul. And I wouldn't have found out about it if I hadn't found on eBay the, a, someone had the annual report of the London City Mission from 1924 and it just happened to mention that Boren was the speaker. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll grab that. And I'm reading this account and I'm thinking, you were joking. This is, because Jeff, if that had been me, I'll tell <laughs> you right now, you'd know. I, I'd make sure, you know, I, 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 the other week I was, you know, I was, I was in London, you know, I was, I was the guest, I, you know, 10,000 people turn up to hear me. I was a bit disappointed with that crowd. But, you know, anyway, I, I, I'd <laughs> say it. <laughs> I'd do it. I'd, I'd do it. So I'd, I'd kind of make it sound humble somehow. 
but I really want you to know. Well, he didn't Absolutely. do that. Yeah. And I, I, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, who is this guy? Because that that traces all through his life, and even when um, his his biographer, uh, T. Howard Crago, who was, who became a, a good friend of his, a, a much younger pastor, um, really admired for him, and, and sat down with him and to write uh, recollections that he that he didn't put into my pilgrimage. Mm. Forum um, swore him on on pain of death. Don't publish this be before I die. You you wait till I'm dead, yeah. then put it out there. And and so that that's what he did. But even then, Bor and, um, Craigo says that there were things that I put in there that actually happened. That Borum said, "Don't tell him. Don't put that in." Yeah. So Bo so so see how Craigo does these sort of little hints of. Some of the things, like for example, um, illusions. Years ago, to uh, what is now the, the, known as the territory of Bangladesh, which back in the day was was India. You, and you're wandering through some of the villages there. You'll see a, a small hospital, uh, a dispensary, uh, that's known as the John Broadbanks Dispensary. Mm -hmm. Forum funded that. Yeah. From the royalties of his books. If you're ever in Melbourne and you go to the Kew Hospital, Kew is one of the suburbs are just outside of the city center precincts and that's where Borum uh ended up spending the rest of his life his house in uh, uh, there um he uh you can go to the q hospital there's an entire wing called the fw Borum wing yeah i think who funded that that's and amazing then you go then you go to the, the global was a global interaction center in uh, hawthorne or to another another in a city suburban part of Melbourne. And there's a six story building there dedicated to Baptist mission. You go to the sixth floor and you've got the FW Borum library where missionaries on furlough can come and just sit and relax and read. And, and outside that library is a, a glass showcase and hardly anyone know about it. Hardly anyone knows about this and hardly anyone's ever heard of it. And inside there is all the memorabilia that that Boren was given, like his OBE from Queen Elizabeth yeah. in 1953, an OBE for preaching. Yeah, that's great. And literature. And you're right. How come no one knows about this guy? Well, I'm trying to correct that. Yeah, no, that's right. I know, <laughs> because I'm... I think his life is actually inspiring. Uh, I think that's something that really does come across through um, through Boren's writing, and uh, I think through your documentaries as well. This is a this is a man who's genuinely concerned with the glory of God and with the the the, the attention being drawn to the Lord Jesus rather than to himself. And I think that there's there's probably some other reasons as well why why he's been a little bit forgotten. But it's it's great that there's this this work going on and and the attention that you're drawing to Boren. Um, it, it's it's encouraging to know that other people are going to be able to pick up his stuff. We we said that um, my pilgrimage would be a good place to start. I think the documentaries are perhaps the best place to start for getting into mm. getting into F W Borum. And so they were F W Borum dot com, and the catalog yes. is is there. Yeah, that's right. And so you'll also see some many of the uh, essays of Borum that that have uh, sort of lapsed out of the one hundred year copyright span. You know, I'm, I'm putting up there just. Uh, as well so you can have a sample of of what what he wrote and i think to to be able to uh, admire that okay he's yes you're right he's using a language of you know the 19th century into the early 20th century which was very very polite and chivalrous and and that doesn't you know it sounds foreign to our ears today and i guess we I, I would say his writing's charming you know there's a charm to what he's what he's saying and the way he puts it. And sometimes he's referring to authors like Mark Rutherford and things like this, that most readers today would be unfamiliar with, but you, you would still find, I think lessons to be learned from what he's written and by realizing these were actually his sermons. And so when he was in Melbourne and he was getting a lot of attention, there were, shall we say petty envy coming from some pastors who uh, would say things like this? Oh, yeah, yeah. But okay, he's everyone thinks he's a great preacher, but he doesn't actually preach. He just tells stories. Oh, yeah, cool. If I told stories, I could draw a big, big crowd like Boren too. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like how 
how petty is that? Um, because isn't that what, didn't Jesus do that a bit? Didn't Jesus tell stories? I mean, like, you know, like my first point is, I don't think Jesus ever said that. <laughs> and, you know, and, and now if you'll all stand, I'd like to pronounce Benedict. You know, he, he just, he told stories. And I think Boren picked up on that. He picked on, up on that propensity that we all have to be drawn into stories and then realizing that many of these stories, when you read them, you, you realize that Boren would have walked into the pulpit and many of those, he would have just said uh, in a way, and he, he talks about, in going to the Dunedin courts in the early days and watching the barristers defend a criminal case with a man convicted of murder. And he, and, and it, it, the thought occurred to him, this barrister has to use everything within his capacity to get that man off. What back in that day was hanging death. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't lock him away for, for life in, in 1895. We, we dispatch them. And so yeah. this barrister had a had a job to persuade people because it was a matter of life and death. And Boreham realized, aren't I doing that? Yeah. Isn't isn't that what I'm doing as well? And so he, he began to go to the theatre and he'd watch how people projected their voices and, and how they used emotion in their voices and, and he, he began to work on lowering his voice and and he he began to develop the craft of persuasive preaching mm -hmm. and storytelling. And so I think there, again, um, we, we've only got a few recordings of him. Um, and, but people, you know, I, I spoke in, in the documentary, I've got some people who, even to this day, Jeff, they, they were telling me, I remember the time he preached and they tell me the sermon. I mean, some of these people were in their, their 80s, early 90s, yeah, yeah. and they heard Borum in, in 1943 yeah. when when he, he was the interim pastor of the Kew Baptist Church, where after he left Armadale, he moved to the nearby suburb of uh, Kew, where he, he actually lived in Kew, and he attended there. And then during the war, the, the pastor was seconded to be, be a chaplain in the army, and they asked him, could you be the interim pastor here well his interim pastor it was three years and he said if i stay any longer i'll have to consider this my fourth uh, pastorate and thereby uh, violate my prophecy when i started out uh, <laughs> so but just again just to, I, and I'm, I, I was i went to the nursing home where i was interviewing one of these uh former congregation members of q baptist and i and as i'm i'm interviewing this man I'm hearing him tell me of a sermon he heard, he heard preached in 1944 by Borum. I thought, good grief. I, I, if I have someone remember my sermon the next day, if I have someone remember my sermon. If you remember your sermon after, the next day. But if I remember my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it was clearly, it was clearly, a, he had a way that he, he, he saw preaching and pastoring as the package and he, he worked at it so well. And there was the time in 1936 where he was on an American tour. So he his last international visit, um, he went Europe and America. And, and he was asked to speak in a number of universities. And again, he doesn't tell us how many people came, but, but they're, they're talking about filling these stadiums. And you think, well, I'd be... I'd be telling people, <laughs> but he didn't. And then he was assigned to these topics that he, he said, I knew nothing about these topics. I had a message prepared from one of my things that I was going to do. And so he said at one occasion, he, he was, he had to speak on something or other economics philosophy or something or whatever it was. And, and he would, he was doing his normal message. And he said, now the obvious implications to economic philosophy, I, I hope is obvious to you. And we'll just proceed. And at the end of it, the, the, the university uh, president came and said, that was the best lecture. That was the best lecture on economics we've ever had. <laughs> anyway. um, I remember, I remember talking, I remember talking to you once. I think it was a conversation that we had when I first, I, I was speaking at a conference in, in Waihola. So just, just south of uh, Mosgill. Um, and it was a church history talk. And I gave three, three addresses or it might have been four addresses on Borum um, and I was wrestling with that question why is he being forgotten 
And I think I think one of the answers you gave me, and I've always thought it's a, a compelling one, is that um, you know, in in God's sovereignty, maybe maybe he's intentionally been forgotten for the sake of being remembered at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, and and maybe, you know, that, that might be my plug for for people asking, you know, why should I why should I get interested in Borum? Why mm. should I read Borum? Yeah. Maybe maybe just as we wrap up, what would be your last, you know, your last sales pitch be for people to for Christians today or anybody, I suppose, to get into reading and, yeah. and getting to know FW Borum? Yeah, it would include things like this, that th- there I think there was um uh, someone who gave a commendation, like a very, very famous preacher, uh, gave a commendation of the documentary series and said that he would read a Borum essay every day. And he was probably one of the, the world's most famous preachers at that time. Mm. And this is only a few years ago. And then it, it, uh, I think, when you realize that uh, Billy Graham and his wife, Ruth yeah. committed to read an FW Boren book themselves for their own soul's sake every year. And when we go to the modern era and, and I begin to hear a whole new generation, such as Dr. Andy Bannister from the Solas uh, Institute in the UK, uh, who now refers to Dr. FW Boren all the time. Now he was the, the former Canadian director for RZIM, which might give you a clue about who I was referring to yeah, before, yeah. that uh, th- there is a generation that are now beginning to realise here is someone not only whose who's writing still speaks today, but the way he went about ministry still speaks today to those of us who are in ministry. In other words, it, for him it wasn't my call is to be a pastor and the evangelist is, is out there doing his thing. He said, no, no. It, it was like he saw his role as both strengthening and equipping the saints yeah. and also reaching the, the, the community at large who were not reached yet. And that's why he wrote his weekly columns. That's why he was writing for the Otago Daily Times, you know, for 38 years or so, also being published in the Melbourne Age, the Melbourne Argus, you know, various Baptist newspapers with the hope that it was going to be evangelistic. And this was probably the biggest lament he had of, of his life too, that he wasn't evangelistic enough. But eternity will prove him wrong. And uh, I think this also should give each of us as pastors just just the the confidence that sometimes we think we're not really touching people with what we're doing because Borum certainly felt that but in looking back from our vantage point at a vantage point that Borum himself didn't have we can we can see no actually he touched way more people and may not just people but but strategic people than he than he ever realized and I think that also will be I think that that eternity will re- will reveal that in your ministry, Jeff. Eternity will reveal that in in every pastor in New Zealand. You you realise, you know, what you preach, what you say, what you do, is actually going to make a difference for eternity. And I, I think Borum made eternity his his life focus right near the end. I'll finish with one one, one thought, which I think is profoundly impacted me mm. in in his recollections toward the end of his life he said he he said this i i have one regret and i thought oh and it, i was all ears and he said my and, and i was thinking this is one of the in 1924 he was considered the most influential preacher in the world he was hailed by you know the young queen elizabeth who had heard him and given him that order of the british empire medallion mm. for his services to preaching and and for re- religious writing, and and yet he said this: I, I have one regret about my preaching, and that is I didn't I didn't talk about God enough. Mm-hmm. I thought that's amazing. He said, "Oh yeah, I I would describe him in abstract terms about what he did and his attributes and things like, but but not him." Yeah, sure. He said, "I I became 
my, my regret was so deep that I realized if I'd only been able to convey to people the beauty of Christ, the mm. majesty of Christ, the wonder of Christ and talked about him more, I'm sure more people would have been drawn to him. Absolutely. And Jeff, I cannot tell you the impact that sentiment has had on my hope for what I'm doing as well. No, it's a great challenge for all of us. I think that's a, a brilliant place for us to, to wrap up. Andrew, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you for being willing to give so much extra time than what I initially asked for as well and spreading this over two sessions. Um, thank you to those of you who've joined us at home. You've been listening online. Um, I trust that this has been a blessing and a help to you. I really encourage you to to pick up something by Borum. Have a look at the, the documentaries on fwborum.com. There's the FW Borum Facebook page that Andrew's mentioned. So many ways to, to access his stuff. And I'm no doubt it'll be a real help and an encouragement to you. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time on our next Fig Chat. Thank you. Thank you.